Well, I was part uh, together with Angie as a project manager uh, to all of this, so that was exciting. And I've got a notebook full of questions for you guys, so uh, be ready for that. But um, we will also open it to the public, so if you have any kind of question, please make sure you, um, yeah, just, just think about something. We will have maybe time for those. Um, so, let's start with the brief introductions with uh, the two of you, because uh, they don't know you yet. So please, Paolo, if you want to go first, and then Dimitro. Yeah, okay, sure. So, I'm Paolo. I'm the lead software engineer of the MainChain team in uh, Horizon Labs. Uh, and obviously, I'm referring to uh, our um, main blockchain software that is run every day by every user of our blockchain, including uh, node operators, uh, miners, uh, exchanges, and so on. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dmitro. I'm a research engineer at Input Output, but also I have a very deep connection to the Horizon project. Um, I was involved in the initial launch of the mainnet back in 2017, and I contributed to the core development during the early stage. And since then, um, I became an active member of the project and participated in many research endeavors. Most notable is probably the research of sidechains, uh, which eventually led to the appearance of Zendo. Great, and uh, Alberto was talking about uh, this guy before, during his presentation. So he was uh, actually the, the guy uh, from Ukraine helping us uh, with, the, with the code, as Rolf was telling us yesterday in this presentation. So Paolo, uh, let's uh, kick it off. And uh, the first question is, uh, uh, OK, this is about Zendu and what's next. Let's start with uh, saying that uh, anybody in the community can influence the future of Zendu, right? Because we have a process in place, which is Zen IPs, and thanks to which anybody can really contribute and influence the future of Zendu. So how does that work? So uh, basically, as um, all the main blockchain software in the world, um, Horizon is definitely open to contributions from the community. So if we look at a project like Bitcoin, they have a process to uh, let users submit uh, any um, uh, suggestion um, of a new feature or improvement. And this process is called uh, BIP, that stands for Bitcoin Improvement Proposal. Uh, Ethereum, uh, another example, uh, as something similar that is called obviously Ethereum Improvement Proposal and uh, Zendu is no different as we have the Zen AP. So what is uh, an improvement proposal? It's just uh, a document uh, in which users can describe uh, a change that, that they would like to introduce into our project. So um, such documents typically include uh, a section with uh, uh, providing some context, uh, like the reasons why we should take into account such change. Um, then, obviously, a um, uh, description of all the technical details behind the change. And uh, also, uh, very important, um, an analysis of the impact of such change in terms of pros and cons. So, um, Given that it's uh, an open uh, process, uh, we have a GitHub repository in which we store and collect all uh, the Zen APs. So if you are curious, uh, you can find there uh, a Zen AP um, describing uh, Zendu and its cross-chain transaction protocol. Um, another um, Zen AP related to our uh, sidechain versioning system and uh, also uh, the last one that is still a draft uh, is about um, the possibility to let users create uh, non-seizable sidechains. Uh, so, uh, as you said, the most important thing here is that uh, it's a process open to anyone. Uh, so, it's uh, a great opportunity for uh, users uh, from our community to have an impact into our project. Uh, it might sound scary at the beginning because if you are not used to 
deliver such documents. Uh, it's, um, it requires some effort. Uh, but in the end, the good news is that uh, it's uh, an iterative process. So you can start by uh, providing um, a brief document uh, describing just the idea uh, at a high level of detail. And then uh, you can step by step uh, refine it until it reaches uh, a good level of maturity. Uh, also, eventually relying on the help of other users from the community or uh, Horizon Labs uh, itself. So according to me, it, this is going to be um, uh, a very important thing in the future of Sendu, as on one side, uh, we plan to use it even more um, to start the discussion with our uh, community. And also, I really hope that uh, we will have uh, periodically uh, the NAPs uh, uh, published by our users. Right, and obviously we hope to see a growing amount of those. So um, that's actually a call to action if you are a, a person interested in that. Please have a look and uh, yeah, help us tuning uh, the future of Zendu. Uh, Dimitro, uh, my first question would, for you would be, so you have been uh, one of the authors of uh, all the papers behind Zendu, right? And uh, from the very first one to the Latus Incentive Scheme and the most recent ones, and we'll talk more about that later, but uh, why is that important uh, uh, to, um, let's say, detail an idea on a paper? Why is it convenient? And uh, is it a strategy that we can apply also for the future? Thank you for the question. Indeed, I was involved in many research projects at Horizon. Um, in general, we try to follow a certain process when doing research. Uh, first of all, we start by ideating a certain concept. We define what is the problem, what are possible solutions, uh, whether other people consider this problem and what they come up with. And usually the outcome of this uh, process is some basic understanding of what we want to achieve and how. And then the second stage is to formalize the rough idea into, into some form, into some written form, like a paper or a specification, depending on the need. And it is a very important stage because it allows to reveal a lot of hidden details that cannot be captured during the informal ideation uh, process. So uh, the third stage, the, the outcome of this stage is usually some written paper. And the third stage is to reveal the results to a wider audience. Um, if this is something important and foundational, for instance, like Zendu, it is absolutely necessary to, to get additional verifications through through an external peer review process. So um, we often submit the paper to, to a conference or to a journal uh, to get, so that it additionally ensures us in the correctness of the results. And then the next stage is to hand over to the development team, which is usually goes smoothly because we already have a written document, well-defined, um, all in all, this establishes a rigorous research process and it allows us to, to have uh, good solutions. This is in contrast to many other blockchain startups that uh, usually adopt the ad hoc approach to research when they design and implement things on the fly. And um, in many cases, this leads to inefficient solutions and sometimes to damaging hacks. And moreover, it's important from the promotional standpoint to bring awareness about our ideas and about the project in general to a wider public so that people start to build on top of our ideas and to extend them. Yeah, so definitely we will do it in the future because it already proved the efficiency. Great, so it helps us uh, throughout the, let's say, putting down the, an idea on, uh, uh, yeah, putting down the idea from a design perspective and then throughout the development cycle. And uh, we talk more about that with Paolo, who has been one of the uh, developers actually uh, developing it. Uh, so, Alberto, um, so you already spoke, uh, we already, we just spoke about Zen IPs, right? But uh, there are already ideas uh, there for the future of Zendu, and one of them is the Saxon State 
And you already introduced the topic in your talk, but uh, I find it particularly interesting and maybe you would, uh, I would ask you to deep dive on that or any other thing that you believe it's important to mention here for the future of Zendu. Yeah, um, I mean, we already discussed about the importance of having a Saxon state. Uh, I mean, for sure, uh, for what regards the, the protocol perspective, uh, it's important for enabling the, the communication, but um, it's, it's also important from a usability perspective. I mean, Mina was one of the first uh, uh, going in this direction. I mean, having, I mean, in a traditional blockchain, to be, to be able to understand if what is the current state of the blockchain without relying on any party, I mean, this, this requires to validate the whole history of the blockchain until that moment. And it's crazy, if you, if you think about it. <laughs> Instead, with a succinct proof, you can do it by just verifying one proof. Okay, and this is very, and it's very succinct. Now it's possible to have it very succinct, and also the verification is, is very quick. But also, you can think that once you have a proof of, let's say, execution of the block. So, let's say, you have a block that is including uh, many transactions, okay? Maybe executing even smart contracts, no? Currently, if you want to broadcast this block, every node has to, for validating the block, uh, has to re-execute all the transactions, all the smart contracts to be able to be sure that the next, what is the next state, and also if, I mean, what is happening is correct, is reflecting the history, no? For example, spending coins that were there, or uh, uh, selling or sending a token that uh, someone really had. As you can see, this delays the propagation of the block also. And, you know, the security of a blockchain is also related to the time the block arrives to the, let me say, to a certain percentage, let's say, of, of forgers, miners, whatever. And you can see that the more transaction you put on it, the more execution, okay, you put on it, the more time it takes to be validated. And so, at every hop, at, at every node, you increase this time. And so, this is something that really prevents uh, scalability. But now, remember, we have a, a proof of the execution of the block. So, the verification of the block can take a very succinct time. And so, you're able to increase the throughput also for this reason. So, I mean, this is another uh, important aspect that I should be taken in consideration, in my opinion. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Alberto. And before, uh, during your presentation, I remember you were saying that at the beginning we were, uh, yeah, not so many delivering uh, Zendu to mainnet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, maybe you could count them on one hand, and uh, Paolo, you were one of those. Um, so how, uh, I mean, it was a huge protocol. You also said more than 100K lines of code. So um, I guess that was a big, big challenge uh, from development standpoint. Uh, what's the team um, like today? So did it grow? How, how is it looking? Uh, um, yeah, you are leading, leading it. So please, can you describe? Yeah, you're right, Luca. So it was quite a, a challenge. So it's impressive for me to look back on the days in which uh, a group of just two people uh, took the responsibility uh, of developing Zendu. So of course uh, there were a lot of other uh, minds behind it. Uh, so for instance people who contributed to the design and we have a, a couple of great examples here. Uh, people who contributed to testing and code reviews and also people who uh, helped us uh, when we were really overwhelmed and needed someone to uh, push the, the development and, and the coding. Um, so I, I would also like to mention that um, 
there was an important contribution from our community in terms of followers. Uh, they uh, always showed their excitement during the, um, that period. Um, and also sometimes uh, uh, showing their concerns and doubts and that pushed us to do even, uh, even better. Uh, so basically Zendu was just the, the first stone uh, upon which we started um, um, developing our ecosystem. And after that important milestone, uh, we uh, started wondering how we could uh, uh, change our organization internally uh, in order to start scaling up very quickly. So uh, we changed a lot uh, in terms of process and also we grew a lot. So for instance, uh, our main chain team passed from having just uh, two people to having uh, four uh, full-time engineers working on uh, Zendu, and we also now have uh, a project manager, and we will uh, we are going to have uh, also a um, product manager uh, very soon. Um, so uh, right now uh, we can leverage on um, a more experienced team uh, with more members, and that is going to help us doing um, many more things in the future. Uh, and uh, doing that even better. And that is uh, this growth of our teams, just the reflection of the growth of our, uh, Horizon Labs. So uh, every team uh, grew a lot, and uh, that is important also because in order to deliver new features and continue maintaining Zendu, we need the support of other teams, like for instance, just to make an example, uh, the infrastructure team. So. Um, also, they grew a lot, and thanks to that, we can now uh, be supported uh, by them in uh, an even better way. Uh, whenever we need, uh, for instance, I don't know, uh, to release a new version of Zendu, or uh, whenever we need some testing, or when we have to touch our continuous integration process. So uh, this is going to be um, a great opportunity uh, for us to. Um, do a lot of things in the future with uh, an increased pace. So let's say Horizon Labs has now more capacity to code whatever, uh, um, let's say, whatever comes uh, with the Zen AP process, right? Yes, exactly. They are strictly connected. And we have some of them here. <laughs> so Dimitro, um, I know that uh, speaking about papers, there is a new one fresh off submission. Uh, it's a sidechain to sidechain protocol, uh, and you will have a, a speech related to that. So how does it fit? Uh, uh, how is it related to the Zendu model? Um, right. Just recently, we published a new paper named uh, Trustless Cross-Chain Communication for Zendu Sidechains. Um, it was written by myself, Alberto, and Roman Olinikov, who is another great member of our research team. And yes, the, this paper is a further step in the development of the Zendu ecosystem, and it defines the method for sidechains to communicate among each other directly. Um, as you know, Zendu only defined the cross-chain transfer protocol between the main chain and the sidechain, and it was necessary to allow sidechains to communicate among each other directly. So yes, the paper defines the protocol for cross-sidechain communication, and moreover, it uh, describes how we can transfer tokens among different sidechains. OK, great. Well, looking forward to your speech. And uh, Alberto, uh, last question for you, and then we can open it up uh, uh, for the public. And uh, looking retrospectively, what were the biggest challenges uh, in you know, designing, developing all of this, and what could be the biggest challenges I had, because this is also a topic for Zendu, what's next? Huh. This is good. <laughs> okay, the challenges were many, really, I mean, of many different kind. I mean, from the technical standpoint, organizational standpoint, but also, I mean, one of the, you heard the story, no? So, also, keeping the focus is uh, one of the main challenge because 
only if you are really focused, you can uh, you can uh, uh, let me say achieve your goal. But I mean, I'm super proud of all our team and how we grow. So that I mean, these made possible to achieve the goal that that we achieve and and do the all the things that uh, we have done in this year. So I mean, so the big congratulation I think is is to the is to the engineers, team members in general, whoever. Uh, really contributed to this and make it possible. Okay, great. Well, any question from the public? If yes, just raise your hand. Yeah, we have one there. Let me come there. Ah, he has it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, uh, when, I, when you were talking, Alberto, about uh, the recursive snarks, allowing nodes to not have to sync, you know, by downloading lots and lots of data about the blocks and uh, transaction hashes, stuff like that. Instead, they could just examine the recursive proof for the entire state of the blockchain and that would be enough for them to at least validate that it, the, the state of the blockchain was accurate. Like, do you, um, but of course, you know, that doesn't help with um, things like being able to show the actual transactions to a user or, or being able to like find the ID of a UTXO that, that you need to, to spend, right? So th those are two different things, right? That's like, correct. Yeah, okay. That's correct. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. You have a, a, a succinct proof of the state, but this doesn't provide the, you the ability to uh, have the information, for example, for, for spending that, uh, that coins that you received, or be aware about a transaction that happened. Uh, but, okay, uh, you can use also different channels to, uh, to send this kind of information, but as you can see, the, the advantage of having a Saxon proof of the whole state is so big that you can find other ways for exchanging what is needed for, um, for notifying a user that you send the coins. And he can, he can uh, uh, let me say, uh, immediately verify that it's true because you have a proof of the state. So it's, uh, it's going to be very easy. Yeah. Actually, that brings me to the second part of my question, which is like, as blockchains, the data gets bigger and bigger and bigger and we're trying to scale faster. Do you think it's important for like a sort of a different architecture where people are relying more on those, uh, you know, like an average node is just relying on the recursive snark and not really worrying about having that archive of data. And there's some sort of a different mechanism for, for getting that, that back past data um, and just doing, just doing business as usual with just recursive snarks. I mean, having a proof of the Saxon state for sure is, is important, but I mean, for sure, you have also to provide in the lock uh, uh, the information that are useful to reconstruct the state. That's, that's another key point. You can even forget about providing, uh, and this, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's related to a discussion uh, we had with Vanishiri. That you can even, uh, let's say, avoid including, uh, for example, the signatures in the block. Because in reality, the signatures were, I mean, are not useful for understanding the new state. They are just, let's say, uh, used for providing a proof that I had the right for spending something, but are not useful for, for the state itself. So you can avoid even this kind of information. But it's important that you provide the information for reconstructing the state. So this is another uh, important thing. Yeah, thanks for the question. Very sure, question. thank you. I see another one there. Rob, maybe. So I know this is part of the uh, thought process and development and discussion because it's something that uh, Coda Mina has brought up as well as we see with Zcash. Zero knowledge proofs and s private transactions are difficult to do on mobile devices. Um, you, can, you have to have a lot of access to the blockchain and computing power and all sorts of things like that. Will the succinct proof um, make it easier to do shielded or private transactions on mobile devices? Or is that a whole another level of development that's important to do? I want to be able to send private transactions from my phone. There's uh -huh. no way to do that right now. Right. In a way that protects my anonymity. Okay, can I, uh, and just to provide a little bit of context, currently, uh, 
some information for doing a shielded transaction are needed and has to be used by the, the user itself. Otherwise, it can leak some information that would make shielded transaction, let me say, traceable, at least by the user that is generating the proof. So now the user is obliged to generate the proof. Okay? Otherwise, it will leak some information. Uh, okay. It really depends on the, uh, let's say, the two things are not, the, the succinct state uh, is not strictly correlated on how you can solve this, uh, uh, the, um, this problem. Because in any case, to um, not reveal any information, I mean, you need to have the information. And so, but one thing that you can, I mean, ha but now having, you're right, having the information is going to be easier because you don't have to think from scratch. That's right. So you, we can uh, leverage also this for having a, an easier way for the user that needs to generate the shielded transaction to, um, um, to validate, to, to use the information for, uh, for generating it. Okay, good. And as a follow-on question, is it possible to, or would it be more straightforward to implement that as a private transaction sidechain, kind of starting over from the main chain, uh, to make it, again, the ability to do all sorts of different spending transactions from mobile devices? Let's say... Um, or am I mixing too many things here together? <laughs> I mean, first of all, I mean, one of the... the, the let me say, challenging thing will, uh, and also very interesting thing will be to design a sidechain that will take the the shielded pool to uh, to it and uh, and taking it out from 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 main chain. And this still needs uh, further uh, exploration. So we uh, currently we haven't yet, let me say, a full uh, a complete design for that, and, and so it will take. Um, still uh, other, uh, other developments and, and research. Thank you. Please, Angie. Yeah. Should I call it for a wrap-up? Yes. OK, well, <laughs> <laughs> then thanks much, guys, for your answers. Thanks to the public. Uh, this is a wrap-up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luca, Alberto, Dimitro, and